This is Progress Podcast number 77, and today we're looking at experimental simulation of tornadoes with trains. So trains going through tornadoes, and how do we experimentally simulate this phenomenon? And this is the first podcast, and the second podcast we're going to be looking at the effects of tornadoes on train aerodynamics. So look at this first part, which is how to experimentally simulate the trains going through tornadoes. We're going to look at a paper called Experimental Study of Wind Loading Characteristics of Trains Under Stationary Tornado-Like Vortices. And like usual, this is open access, so you can find it in the link in the description if you want to play along at home. Let's get started here. So they say that a tornado is a micro-scale and strong convective wind with a phenomenon. I should also mention that I got this idea from talking with Rolanda Tillich about uh, one of our amigos about... um, just the simulation of tornadoes and i thought this was quite interesting so looking at this paper because of that idea so thanks for lando again so anyway let's start again a tornado is a micro scale and a strong convective weather phenomenon a quickly rotating column of air that extends from a thunderstorm that touches the ground so trains in japan are often affected by strong tornadoes for instance a high-speed train was hit by a tornado on 25th of december near sakata and it overturned Another train encountered a tornado on the 17th of September, 2006, when traveling at a speed of only 25 kilometers per hour on the Japanese National Railway Road, and the first two wagons overturned. So even if the train isn't going very fast, a tornado can cause a huge amount of damage to, to trains. So in recent years, the density of railway lines in China have been increasing. So that's one of the main reasons why we want to look at the effects of tornadoes on trains and how to simulate them so we can better understand when we increase the number of railway lines that we have, what's the danger and how can we, can we mitigate that danger? So therefore, it is necessary to evaluate tornado-induced aerodynamic forces and strengthen the meteorological monitoring technology to ensure the operational safety of trains, especially in the areas where tornadoes are most common. Due to the difficulties and dangers associated with field measurements and the complexity of tornadoes' boundary layers, a boundary condition, sorry. The parameters defining the characteristics of tornadoes have not been well investigated. Physical modeling of tornado-like, tornado-like structures have become a powerful tool for investigating tornado-induced wind forces on a structure. This modeling approach is similar to boundary layer wind tunnel experiments and has advantages such as controllable conditions and repeatability. So a couple of researchers designed and developed a tornado-like vortex simulator based on basic knowledge of tornado structures and analyze the tangential and radial velocities of of tornadoes. So initial ideas of how to uh, create tornadoes in the lab. And just one thing I highlighted here was something called Cobra probes. So this is just as a side note for instrumentation. The reason why I highlighted this is because Cobra probes are really cool and it's something that not too many people are familiar with. So the Cobra probes fall into the bigger family called multi-hole pressure probes. And multi-hole pressure probes are exactly what they sound like. They're just a probe with a bunch of holes in it. And the reason why they're very useful is because with these different holes, you can measure the pressures in each one of these holes and determine from those pressure differences what the velocity is and then decompose that into the three orthogonal velocities, so U, V, and W. And Cobra probes is really the like extreme version in one sense where they only feature four holes and yet you can get these three orthogonal velocities in a cone if as long as the oncoming flow is within a 45 degree cone of the central axis so they're very useful and the reason why having fewer holes is beneficial is because it makes the probe smaller so there's a general um, trade-off in pressure tapping where you can either make the holes bigger and you can get an increase in frequency response that way, so the entire probe is bigger, or if you wanna make the probe smaller, you have to make the hole smaller, but then the frequency response of your tubing, of your pressure sensors drops because it takes time for the information to pass through the tubing. So a bigger hole, you get um, greater frequency response, small hole, um, lower frequency response, but you have that spatial change there. So with Cobra probes, because they only use four holes instead of the traditional five, you get rid of one of the holes and that way you can make the entire probe smaller, which means that you can get it into a smaller area and still have similar sort of frequency responses of a bigger probe. Now, of course, you can, can go the other way where if you want to uh, measure the velocity in very um, in, in flows with very high swell, so you don't really know what angle the velocity is coming at. It could be 180 degrees or 175 degrees or whatever. Um, you can use 10, 15, 17 hole pressure probes. So they are very 
um, extensive voice. Cobra probes are very um, niche where they, you, if you know what the general velocity is going to be like, you can put it, the cobra probe in that uh, line in that direction and get the three orthogonal components quite well. And they're, I just wanted to talk about that because cobra probes are, are really cool objects and they're actually made by, or invented by a guy called Elan Crew back in the 70s from memory. So let's move on back to um, the other instrumentation. So back onto simulating a wind tunnel in a, uh, simulating a tornado in a wind tunnel with trains. The available literature concerning tornado induced wind loads on trains is limited. A bunch of researchers conducted preliminary model experiments to investigate the aerodynamic forces acting on a train traveling through a tornado. The results showed that the aerodynamic forces changed the magnitude and direction depending on the position of the train in a swirling flow, and the train itself may deform the flow field, so that makes sense. Not only uh, where you put the train in the tornado is it going to affect um, how the forces on the train are developed, but also that's going to have an effect on the tornado itself. So some researchers investigated especially varied aerodynamic load characteristics of the high-speed train with different locations of the tornado center. Along with the effects of the viaduct and windscreen on the wind loads, it was found that the windscreen alters the mechanism of the tornado vortices train viaduct interaction and therefore changes the most unfavorable location of the tornado center for total force coefficients. So in other words, depending on the setup of the train, it's going to affect um, the loading of the forces on the train. So in this study, which is going to be covering this podcast 77 and podcast number 78, the next one, which will come out in a few days time. So in this study, pressure measurements on a rigid train car model under stationary tornadoes were performed to investigate the effects of the distance between the tornado's core and the longitudinal axis of the train car, the swell ratio and the ground roughness on the wind pressure distributions on the train's surface and wind load characteristics. The findings can be helpful to determining the threshold conditions for raising the alarm when safety is compromised. So they're looking at the effects of a tornado on a train, but considering the tornado strength effectively and the ground roughness, because as we'll cover in a sec, the ground roughness does affect a tornado's formation. And now we're going to look at how to actually simulate a tornado in a wind tunnel. So the experimental setup, tornado vortex simulator. So in the simulator, a circular a circular duct, 1.5 meters in diameter and 0.89 meters in height is suspended on a horizontally movable steel frame. Let's scroll down to the picture here. And I have the text on another page, which I'll read from, so you can look at the picture while I'm reading. So the fan, which is in the center, it generates an updraft flow, maximum flow rate of 4.8 cubic meters per second, which is quite a lot. And this gains some rotational momentum as it passes through the top guiding vanes. Then, subsequently, the airflow is redirected to the surface of the platform through a wide annular duct, and the horizontal flow gradually converges on the center of the simulated floor and converts into an upward vertical airflow. Consequently, a spiraling tornado vortex is formed between the platform and the honeycomb. So in other words, you have a fan sucking all this air up, and then it has to go around the edges of the structure, and then it comes back down on the, on the sides. And as it hits the ground, all this flow comes in, it has to converge to go back up into the fan. And it, this motion creates this um, swirling motion and a tornado in this, as a result. Consequently, a spiraling, spiraling tornado vortex is formed between the platform and the honeycomb, as I mentioned. The tornado wind field can be adjusted by changing the angle of the guide vanes, so the, how you're funneling the flow around the outside of the structure, the speed of the fan, so how much you're sucking the air through, and the height of the simulator over the platform. So how much your, how much distance there is once you're throwing the air into the ground, how much it can um, like recuperate kind of thing. So that's how you make a tornado in a wind tunnel, which is really cool. So, but there are a bunch of experimental parameters that we need to consider. First, measurements were carried, conducted on the model with a fan working at 13 positions, which can correspond to a R, varying from zero to 200 millimeters with an increment of 20 millimeters. So in other words, when you have a tornado and you put your train next to it, you have to put the train at a certain distance away from the tornado because obviously, depending on how close the tornado is to the train, different flow physics are going to occur and different forces. So by putting them at um, very close to the 
tornadoes core or very far away, you can get different forces and they've normalized this to the tornado's core. So if you're at a distance of one, it means that you're um, at the very edge of the tornado. And if you're at a distance of zero, it means you're in the tornado's um, eye. And they're looking at ranging from zero to 3.75. So anywhere from right in the tornado's eye to quite far away, well outside of the tornado core. So this is important when wind tunnels because you want to be able to move where your train is or your object is compared to where the tornado is. So another main parameter that controls the structure of the tornado, tornado wind field is a swell ratio. And this swell ratio is a measure of the tornado's rotational intensity and is defined as the ratio of the tangential circulation flow of the tornado to the updraft flow. So the greater the tangential circulation flow is compared to the updraft flow, the greater the swell ratio. However, it is usually difficult to measure both the tangential circulation flow and the updraft flow in the tornado-like wind field induced by the tornado vortex simulator. Alternatively, the swell ratio can also be written as S equals tan theta divided by 2A, where, which depends on the simulator's geometrical dimensions only, where theta is the angle of the guide vane. So again, how um, you're guiding the air around the outside of the structure. A is the aspect ratio expressed as um, the height of the simulator over the platform and the um, updraft hole radius. So um, the fan radius effectively, how much you're pulling the, up, the air in, it seems. With these parameters, you can determine what the swell ratio is just through mathematics because of geometry. And for this wind tunnel, they're looking at, in this experiment, they're looking at three different swell ratios of 0 0.15, 0 0.35, and 0 0.72. So in other words, ranging from about 15% the um, tangential flow is about 15% of the updraft flow or ranging up to 72%, which is very um, tangential, tangentially oriented flow. In addition, ground roughness is also affecting the tornado's uh, performance. So ground roughness was taken into consideration due to different terrains of train routes. It was observed that the effects of ground roughness on tornado-like flow structures, such as core radius, tangential velocity, and pressure drop, are significant. The interaction between ground roughness and the vortex layer is predominant. The ground roughness value lambda in the experiment was defined as the ratio of the total windward area of roughness elements to the surface area of the simulated floor. So in other words, you have the simulated floor, which covers the entire wind tunnel, let's say, like the this idea, this lab, its floor. And depending on how much of this floor is covered in roughness, this determines the lambda value. So if it's 5%, it means 5% of this floor is covered in roughness. If it's zero, it means 0%. If it's 50%, 50% of the, the um, floor is. So these, they looked at three ground roughnesses, 0%, 5%, and 25%, corresponding to roughness categories of A, B, and C in the Chinese codes. Now, interestingly, the roughness that they have are just five millimeter cubes just dotted around the floor, which is quite interesting. It means that they um, are using a fairly, they're not using a statistic model. They're not surveying terrains and just coming up with a general stochastic model that they can put into a wind tunnel. They're just using a um, simplified uniform uh, distribution of five millimeter cubes. So that's an easy way to go and it would probably simulate roughness quite well. I'm not sure what the stochastic um, difference would be. Maybe like, for example, if you have a mountain nearby, you might have some features that a mountain would always accompany and that may change. I don't know, but I'm not a um, geologist I did, I did a semester of geology, so it kind of makes me kind of an expert, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, if you know, let me know in the comments. That's the difference between the two different ways you can simulate roughness. So let's move on to the physical train model and pressure tapping installation. So it's not just important to have the vortex simulated. You obviously want to measure the forces on the, on the train. So to do that, they're putting pressure tappings on the train, which is where you drill into the train into whatever object you have actually for pressure tappings and then you feed uh, tubes through and then you cut them off at the surfaces and you glue them in now there are other ways you can do this but this is the traditional way um, we're actually developing a different way that you can do this and hopefully it'll be out quite soon anyway let's move on the model prototype was a typical wagon for a conventional high-speed train in china with a span of 45 meters a width of 3.75 meters and a height of 3.83 meters and this uses a electric multiple units um, system on top, I guess, without the bogey and pantograph. Now, these, these um, 
things that I mentioned to you, I hear you go through train um, aerodynamics and their setups in podcast number 22 and 23. So if you want to know more about a train setup and how these, what these different things are to begin with and how they affect the aerodynamics and aeroacoustics, check out podcast number 22 and 23. So this train is made of an ABS material, a rigid material, and is approximately smooth. And the platform plane was varnished plywood, which was very smooth. Considering the layout of the measuring points and the limited space underneath the simulator, the geometric, geometric scale ratio of the car was 1 to 75. So what effects would this have in terms of the train speed? Well, the train's not actually moving in this particular case. So the um, Reynolds number here, I'm not sure if it would have too much of an effect in that sense. But in terms of the tornado's strength on the train, there might be some similarities you need to take into account here. And then they just have a picture here of showing the train cabin. And they have these pressure tappings going all the way around the outside and the equidistance, so equispaced. So 15 sections of pressure taps were installed on the central part of the model and 16 pressure taps were distributed across each cross section. And so there are 240 pressure taps in total across this train. And it's a simplified model. As I mentioned, that you don't have the pantograph on top or any of the windows or anything else. It's just um, a flat model, effectively a, a rectangular prism. So let's talk about tornado-like flow characteristics. They say due to the limitation of the uh, size of the probe, so the uh, Cobra probe, wind speed and pressure at altitudes above 10 mil millimeters from the simulated floor were measured only. So let me talk about this. Now, when you put an instrument very close to the ground, often it will change its performance. And the reason why is because the if you have a Cobra probe, for example, or any, or any multi-hole pressure probe, the flow has to go around the probe. And you've calibrated this probe in free stream velocity very far away from the walls. So that means that when the flow goes around the probe, it moves in a certain way and you've calibrated for that. When you put it close to the ground, the flow has to move in a different way because it's, there's one surface which the flow cannot um, penetrate through, obviously. It has to follow that surface. So that means how the flow is going to move around the probe will be different. And that means that your calibration curves will be wrong. So that's why you have to move it away from the floor. And for Cobra probes in particular, they give you really good... Um, uh, rules of thumb in terms of how close you can go to the ground with certain uh, probe um, dimensions. And so they're saying above 10 millimeters is the safe range. When you go below 10 millimeters, the effects of the floor on the readings will be significant, which is why you can't really get it that accurately. And this doesn't just go for multiple pressure probes. It goes for many different apparatus, including uh, hot wires, for example. We need to get certain hot wires to measure boundary layers, for example, because the whole wire itself does change the flow. So this is just something you have to keep in mind for all experiments. So I just want to cover that instrumentation idea because um, it's an interesting thing to be aware of. So the vertical profile of the wind velocity is one of the key factors in determining the wind loads on a train. The tangential velocity was found to increase with the distance from the vortex center to the vortex core radius. So in other words, as they, um, as you move away from the, you want to know what the profile of the velocity is going away from the, the tornado. And now they're going into that to see how the velocities around the tornado are, are changing as you move further and further away. So you have some understanding of what will happen with the train even before you put the train into the wind tunnel. So they said, I'll, tell, I'll cover this a little bit again. So the tangential velocity, which is a... Um, key factor in terms of the swell factor, as I mentioned earlier, is the tangential velocity compared to the updraft velocity. This tangential velocity was found to increase with the distance from the vortex center to the vortex core radius, where our favorable tangential velocities, peak values, were observed and gradually decreased further away from the core boundary with a relatively smaller gradient compared to the inside vortex core radius. So in other words, at the center of the vortex, this tornado, this tangential velocity is very small because you're in the eye, we will know that. And as you move further um, away from the core, you're still in the tornado though, this tangential velocity increases. So how much how much force really will be on you will increase too. Then once you get past the vortex um, boundary, tornado boundary, and you move further away, this velocity decreases. So the maximum velocity is really at the edge of the tornado. They say both the tangential velocity, 
and vortex core radius increased with increasing swirl ratio. In particular, when the swirl ratio increased from 0.15 to 0.35, the tangential velocity increased notably, whereas it decreased slightly when the swirl ratio increased from 0.35 to 0.72. So that's interesting. So the maximum, and let's look at these contours here. I've got these contours where they show the figure five contours of the tangential, tangential velocity and pressure drops. Tangential velocity and is for the top figures and the pressure drops are for the bottom figures. Interestingly, let's look at the top figures. As we mentioned in the vortex center, the velocity is very small. It's like almost zero meters per second. At the, vor at the um, tornado's edge, that's where we're getting maximum, which we range from 10 meters to 14 meters per second, depending on the tornado itself. Along with the velocities, the pressure is important because um, one of the major um, forces that a tornado can uh, place on an object is the pressure change that will occur inside the tornado because you're swirling around. It's a vortex. Vortices have low pressure cores. So the maximum pressure drop was observed at the center of the vortex core. It decreased with the distance from the vortex center and the maximum gradient was found near the vortex core radius. So in other words, at the center of the vortex, the center of the tornado, we find the lowest pressure, which makes sense. And as you go further away from the center, the pressure drops dramatically until you get to the edge of the vortex. Then it starts to drop a little bit more, but not nearly as um, quickly. Sorry, I think I mentioned that I said that the pressure drops gradually from the vortex environment rapidly. And then when you get to the vortex edge, it then drops gradually from there. So inside the tornado, the pressure changes dramatically with only a small change in uh, spatial distance. So let's move on here. The pressure, the pressure drop increased with increasing swirl ratio. And under a higher swirl ratio, the pressure peak drop at the tornado's course center was significantly larger than that under a small ratio, i.e. a swirl ratio of 0.35 experienced a 1.5 times higher pressure drop compared to that of a swell ratio of 0.15, which makes sense because if you have a greater swell ratio, it probably means that your vortex is probably stronger. That's not necessarily the case, but it's a good bet to make. Um, so that means that the pressure change is going to be greater. The vortex is going to be stronger. The variations in the core radius with the height under swell ratio of 0.35 for different roughnesses and values are presented in figure six. So let's look at figure six now. I've again uh, got another document here that I'll just read from while we can look at this, this figure. So if we have the vortex with different roughnesses on the ground, as we mentioned, lambda, which tells us how much of the ground is covered in these roughness dot things, these little cubes, we want to see how this roughness affects the uh, tornado. So in figure six, an obvious increase in the core radius with height was observed under every roughness condition. In particular, the core radius increased significantly at low elevation. So when you're very close to the ground, the core of the uh, tornado is of the vortex radius is very small. But as you go a little bit higher off the ground, it gets very big very quickly. Whereas the increase slowed when you get to high elevation. So once you get past a certain height, the tornado doesn't really expand in diameter anymore. It stabilizes. And this, they say, is similar to real tornadoes in nature, which is good. We're simulating tornadoes, so we want them to be real. So at lower elevations, a decrease in the core radius was observed with increasing surface roughness. So that's quite interesting. If you have a more rough surface or rougher surface, the tornado core will be smaller near the ground. But as you go to higher elevations, the core radius over a rough surface became larger than that over a smooth one, although the increase was not significant. Moreover, when the height was large enough, the core radii, in, regardless of the surface roughness, was almost the same. So in other words, only very close to the ground does the roughness affect the tornado's uh, size. Once you get past a certain height, the roughness doesn't affect it too much. Consequently, it is reasonable to conclude that the effect of roughness on the core radius is uh, confined to lower elevations. So that is the end of this podcast. From here, we will cover the results of, in the next podcast, of a tornado affecting a train. So we've covered how to simulate this tornado. Now we're looking at the effects of tornadoes on trains, which is really cool. So that's in this podcast. Make sure to like, subscribe, 
And if you do experiments like this, or you do CFD, where you have experimental results that you need to validate your CFD, you need to measure the density of air. The reason why is because the density of air changes on, every, on a regular day, about 2 to 4%. In podcast number 54, we go through how this affects the uh, flow physics and forces on streamline and bluff bodies. And they do affect it a lot. And this makes your experiments more erroneous and makes validating CFD much harder. We make the atmosphere hawk, which makes your experiments much easier to do because it, it measures the density of air very accurately for you and feeds it straight to your computer so you can have all the data there and correct it in real time instead of having these errors just propagate through your research. So link in the description and make sure to pick one up to make your experiments more accurate and make your CFD validation better and easier. And I'll see you in this podcast. Peace out, amigos.